Why hello you love little peppercorns, my name's Noah Lee, god of game criticism and lord of excellent taste, and the Prince of Persia series might just be the most rebooted and reworked series in video game history, from its not so humble roots as the technical marvel that was the original game, which spawned a whole new genre now known as the cinematic platformer, the series would go on to become quite the blockbuster franchise during the sixth console generation after its acquisition from Ubisoft, followed by a fall from grace with middling attempts to recapture the success until its eventual demise in 2010. But, uh, we're getting ahead of ourselves because first we need to establish a proper historical context and a personal connection before we proceed, because that's just what we do. I have to admit that I don't have much of a history with the Prince of Persia series, having only played a handful of titles over the years, and if I'm being honest, walking away from pretty much all of them with a resounding, meh, they're alright. Bruder Bun's original Prince of Persia is probably the one I've played most, primarily out of a historical appreciation as the granddaddy cinematic platformer, but I'd be lying if I said it was one of my favorites in the genre. Even so, that original game, as well as its direct sequel with their beautiful rotoscoped animations, trial and error design, and pacing that makes you feel as though you're playing through a cinematic event once you find Finally figure things out, really got so much right in terms of cementing a new way to experience platforming gameplay, as well as how much smoother and more effective video game animations could be, though it wouldn't be until later titles like Another World and Blackthorn that this genre would really find its footing and prove that this wasn't just a one-off gimmick. After Bruderbun's demise in early 2001, the series was acquired by Ubisoft, who immediately began work on Prince of Persia The Sands of Time, a game that introduced a whole new generation, including myself, to this formerly niche series and has gone down in history as one of the best games of the sixth console generation and the best game in the series overall. Whoa, one of the best games of the generation? Not even close. Best game in the series? Uh, I suppose I agree, but if we're being honest, the Sands of Time is aged about as well as a glass of warm milk in the back of Grandma's cupboard. Look, the Sands of Time is good and all, but even at the time when I first played it, back when it was only a couple of years old, I still didn't think it was all that special and have really only come to appreciate it very recently, mostly for how well it translates the cinematic elements of the original two games into 3D, but that really only holds true for the platforming segments, as everything else about the game is really rough, even for its time, especially the game's combat that's frustrating as hell until you get the hang of it, and once you do, just sort of becomes bland and boring, while the game constantly starts and stops with an obscene amount of cutscenes that you can't understand anyway because the audio is mixed so poorly. There you go, that's my micro critique of the Sands of Time for you. The last game in the series I personally played was The Warrior Within, a grim dark edge fest that was a lot like The Sands of Time, but had a much greater focus on combat and more mature themes, and I hated this game when I first played it on my OG Xbox back in the day, but in my research prior to writing this critique, I went back and played it, as well as The Sands of Time, and you know what? Not bad. It's certainly cheesy, and the constant chug chugga chug of the very out of place heavy metal music is more than a little ridiculous, but the combat is so much better than The Sands of Time, as is the level design, which is also far less linear and even features some light metroidvania elements in that you can come back to previous areas later in the game to get stuff that you missed your first time around. I might have to dive deeper into this one one of these days. After this, the series began to decline pretty rapidly in the eyes of fans and critics alike. Prince of Persia The Two Thrones got sort of middling reviews, the 2008 reboot was well liked by critics, but not so much by fans, and 2010's The Forgotten Sands, which was a kind of but not really tie-in with the Prince of Persia The Sands of Time movie starring Jake Gyllenhaal was an expensive flop, as were the myriad of side and spin-off games for every platform under the sun, and it was clear to everybody at this point that Ubisoft was just beating a long dead horse. Which brings us to today, with Prince of Persia The Lost Crown the now sixth-ish reboot of the series that takes things sort of back to the series' roots by eschewing the 3D action platforming that the series is now known for, opting instead for a side-scrolling 2.5D Metroidvania. Ooh, fancy. Upon its announcement, The Lost Crown was raked over many hot coals on YouTube, Twitter X, and every gaming forum you can imagine, with many fans outraged by just how different this game was when compared to what they had been hoping for for the past 14 years, as well as, to a lesser extent, the art style and tone, which is a much more cartoony take on the series than practically every previous entry, except for that one game on the DS that no one remembers but me. On the one hand, I can understand being a little taken aback by something that's so different from what you've been looking forward to for a long time. Happened to me last year with Artifacts of Chaos, and I do have to admit that I also don't particularly care for this art direction, which looks as though it was taken directly from a certain 5v5 free-to-play shooter, as well as a whole host of other games that try to be as massively marketable and generic as possible. 
Longtime viewers of my work will know that I don't typically care for the look of most 2.5D games, and Prince of Persia The Lost Crown is no exception. The graphics are fine, but they also look like practically every other 2.5D game around. There's just something about this perspective, combined with zooming the camera out, that causes most 2.5D games, regardless of their overall visual style, to all just end up looking and feeling the same. That said, I do have to give the game credit for the way in which the developers took this 2.5D perspective and use it as an excuse to really play with the amount of depth afforded by the backgrounds of each and every area you go to. This aspect of the game is really well done, to the point that I can't even think of a single other game that comes anywhere close to rivaling it in this regard. Little visual touches like these scrolls flowing delicately off of shelves into the background, as well as certain hazards and bosses that jump in and out along the Z-axis go a long way toward rounding out this world and making you forget that it all takes place along a 2D plane, so while the aesthetics of this game are pretty generic, the way the game is constructed is anything but. Though, I do have to admit that if I wasn't trying to keep up with critiquing new releases for this channel, I probably would have skipped this one entirely because I've never considered myself a fan of the series prior to this, but mostly because I just don't like supporting Ubisoft and their shitty business practices. If only there were a way to play games from shitty companies without giving them your money and supporting their anti-consumer practices or fattening the wallets of out-of-touch corporate execs who only see the medium as a vehicle to sell yet another product and gather user data which they can sell to advertisers and make even more money. Hmm. However, this isn't just some rando Ubisoft team. This is Ubisoft Montpellier, the same studio that brought us most of the Rayman games, at least all the ones that matter, Beyond Good and Evil, the experimental From Dust, as well as cult classics like Zombie U and Ghost Recon Advanced Warfighter. What I'm trying to say is that Montpellier is the shining gold nugget in the swampy mire that is the rest of the company, and for that alone I was intrigued and felt confident enough to take a chance on Prince of Persia The Lost Crown, and I'm glad I did, because it's pretty damn good. Prince of Persia The Lost Crown opens up with a cutscene that's strikingly similar in pace and tone to the opening cutscenes of the Souls series, which I found to be more than a little funny, but it does a great job of setting the stage for the rest of the game by cueing us in on the dire situation the Persian Empire is in thanks to a combination of a 30-year drought, constant war with invaders from other lands, and famine and disease abounding. Unlike the previous game, you don't actually play as the titular Prince of Persia, but instead a warrior by the name of Sargon, who is a member of a group of elite soldiers called the Immortals. After a recent battle that acts as the tutorial of the game, the actual Prince of Persia is kidnapped and taken to a mysterious mountain called Mount Kof, which is where the remainder of the game takes place. However, things just aren't right on Mount Kof, as a curse has enveloped the whole place that prevents you from leaving once you set foot upon it, as well as anomalies that cause everyone to experience the flow of time differently, glimpsing moments from the past and future as though they are as real as oneself. It's an interesting enough setup that does a good job of alluding to the shenanigans of the sands of time that have been playing out in the background of most of the series, as well as adding an air of intrigue and mystique to underline the entire adventure, though I do have to admit that the story plays pretty fast and loose with the rules it establishes early in the game, and things don't always line up in a satisfying or clear manner. Ultimately, this doesn't really have that big of an impact on the story or gameplay, but it is very clear that certain aspects of the game's narrative kind of spiraled out of control during development, and the Montpellier team wasn't quite able to rope them back in as tight as they probably would have liked. This also holds true for the rest of the narrative as well, which is just a jumbled mess of inconsistencies that rarely make sense with characters hopping back and forth between which side of the conflict they're on, motivations being established that cause you to recontextualize a character's actions up until this point that are completely irrelevant to the rest of the story, but somehow convince other characters that their previous actions were just, and subplots and character beats sprinkled here and there that are almost immediately forgotten about and never mentioned again. Still, the story was engaging enough that it kept me invested in the characters and wondering in between gameplay sessions just what was going to happen next, despite the fact that every character you meet is a paint-by-numbers archetype that you've seen in hundreds of other works of fiction, while the narrative itself never really does anything interesting enough to make itself noteworthy. That said, I do have to give the game major props for the ways in which it incorporates Zoroastrian mythology into its narrative and world building. It's clear that the dev team spent a lot of time on this aspect of the game, as well as weaving these religious themes naturally in with their own magical world and creating something new and interesting in the process. To the best of my knowledge, this isn't something that any of the previous Prince of Persia games have even considered 
considered, which is kind of a shame based on how important Zoroastrianism was to the beliefs and culture of the Persian Empire. That would be like having a game set in ancient Japan without touching on Shintoism, or one set in ancient India that doesn't even mention Hinduism, so props to the Lost Crown and the Montpellier team for finally taking the setting of Persia seriously for once. Overall, the world building in this game is quite excellent, so while the story and characters aren't really anything special, ultimately the setting is a unique one that manages to pull a lot of weight in making this world believable and interesting without getting in the way of the gameplay. Gameplay, as I've said a million times throughout my career, is all that really matters at the end of the day, and I wouldn't have called The Lost Crown pretty damn good a moment ago if the game didn't deliver in this regard, and as you might expect, it absolutely does. Moving around to Sargon feels really good with his speed, character weight, and animations, and the level design that we'll talk about in a bit, all coming together to just make the act of movement itself satisfying, though admittedly not quite as satisfying as the recent Momodora Moonlit Farewell that we talked about last time. Uh, by the way, if you haven't seen that video yet and you've got the time, I'd suggest checking it out before we continue because I'm going to be building upon topics we discussed in that video as well as doing a bit of comparing and contrasting between these two games because... How could I not when we have two different schools of Metroidvania thought released so close together? You move with the left thumbstick as opposed to the D-pad, and much like Moonlit Farewell, you can press and hold the right trigger button to run. However, unlike Moonlit Farewell, this button also happens to pull quadruple duty as your run button, your slide button, your dodge button, as well as your mid-air dash button, meaning that when you want to run, you actually have to slide first, which admittedly doesn't take all that much time, but it does create a bit of a hiccup whenever you want to gain a little extra speed. Not really a big issue overall, but it is something that takes a bit of getting used to, though I'm also not really sure how you'd make this any better based on everything else the Montpellier team was trying to accomplish with Sargon's core moveset. It doesn't seem all that complicated in the beginning, but by the time it's all said and done, you really start to see just how complex the controls for this game are, and I have to give the dev team major props for how well they slowly introduce these complex mechanics by continually building upon them as the game progresses, rather than just dumping such a complex system into the player's lap from the get-go. At first, things seem fairly straightforward, with you only having to worry about moving, attacking, sliding, and jumping, but then you also have a dedicated parry button, and then you get the aforementioned bow that you can fire in any direction, and an ability that allows you to dash in mid-air, then one that allows you to set a point that you can teleport back to at any time within the same room, then an ability that allows you to grab items, hold them in a pocket dimension, and fling them out at enemies or areas of the map whenever you want, and then an ability that allows you to swap between two alternate dimensions on the fly, followed by a double jump, and then a grapple hook mechanic, not to mention a dedicated healing button, and one that takes a snapshot of the area you're in and adds it to the map so you can keep track of collectibles and secrets that you find along your journey, and the fact that many of these abilities behave slightly differently depending on if you're tapping or holding the button or standing on the ground or are mid-air and god damn. As the game progresses, you really start to get the sense that the Montpellier team struggled to fit all of the maneuvers and abilities they wanted elegantly into standard controllers, but I'll be damned if they didn't knock it out of the park for the most part. This complexity goes even further when we take a look at the game's combat system. Technically, there's only one attack button, but the way your attacks behave depends on a number of factors, like if you're tapping or holding the button, how many times in a row you've pressed the button, what amulets you happen to have equipped at that moment, but most importantly, what direction you're pressing the control stick in, or whether or not you happen to be in the air, on the ground, crouching, sliding, or running. This is what I like to refer to as a conditional combo system, as the type of attack you perform is based largely on your character's position, as well as actions that immediately precede your primary attack, rather than what sequence of attacks you make. And for the most part, it works fine. The idea is to keep your enemies on their toes by constantly switching up your attack patterns, launching them into the air, and then hitting them a bunch before they hit the ground, but because much of this is tied to the analog thumbstick, it can be difficult to get the proper directional input you'd like in the heat of battle, as opposed to more old-school conditional combo systems that were based around the D-pad. More often than not, I would think something like, okay, I want to slide in towards this enemy, kick him up into the air, jump up after him, hit him until he gets knocked away, and then I'll dash over, hit him some more, and then when we land, I'll pop him back up with my swords and do it all over again, but then I go to execute this, and because the thumbstick is analog, I might be holding forward and up slightly, and the game registers my next attack as me attacking above rather than to the side, so I miss the enemy entirely and mess up the whole combo and this happens all the time. To be fair, you can map your movement to the D-pad if you'd like, but then you'd have to map your healing and snapshot abilities to the thumbstick, which is 
arguably worse. Look, I spent a lot of time messing with the controls throughout my playthrough, but ultimately I kept coming back to the default controls as they really are just the best option for this complex control scheme, but that doesn't mean that some trade-offs haven't been made. Add into this all the previously mentioned abilities that also pull double duty as attacks, and this conditional combo system gets even more complex as you can now juggle enemies with your bow, throw your chakram across the screen to keep parrying it and create a never-ending buzzsaw effect, use your grapple ability to pull enemies towards you or pull yourself towards them, or charge up a sword beam attack, use your teleport ability to hold it in place while you go kick some more ass, and then teleport back to that location to finally launch the sword beam, as well as doing a bunch of super-powered cutscene abilities called Athra Surges to lay even more smackdown on your foes. Not to mention your amulets, which is more or less the exact same system as Hollow Knight's charm system, which further augments your character combos and attacks, and we're left with one hell of a complex combat system that somehow feels a lot simpler than it actually is. This is the kind of game that you can pull off some really amazing amazing DMC style combos, but because every button as well as the thumbstick are so overloaded with different controls and nuances that dictate what action does what, it's very easy to accidentally do something different from what you intended. There just isn't enough precision in a combo system like this to accommodate all of its nuances without things getting a little sloppy. Certainly with a lot of practice, you can minimize or completely eliminate instances when you accidentally do something unintended, and after about 30 hours of playing, I finally felt like I was starting to really get the hang of things. It's just a shame that I had already 100% of the game by that point. Just to be clear, I'm by no means saying that the combat system is bad. Quite the contrary, I think it's excellent for what it is. Just that there's a lot of complexity tied to very few inputs, and that makes learning the nuances of the system a lot more difficult than a system that spreads its combos over more buttons like in a character action game. But again, I don't really think the Montpellier team had much of a choice in this based on how many abilities and maneuvers are available at the player's disposal, and in that regard, they did a hell of a good job balancing it all. This was just a trade-off they had to make to deliver the kind of experience they wanted, and ultimately, I think it was one that was worthwhile. To the game's credit, you don't have to be good at the combo system to succeed, as more often than not, just attacking and dodging is sufficient. The combo system is mostly there for players that really want to dig deep with the meta of the game, and acts as something for the average player to practice and master over the course of several playthroughs, and several playthroughs you'll probably want to play. But yeah, something I really wasn't expecting was that I'd want to play through the game again immediately after finishing it. That's always been a strong sign of a quality experience for me, as replayability is something that I greatly value in games, and The Lost Crown has such a huge amount of depth to it that I can very much see myself playing through this game one or even two more times just within the next couple of years. I kind of feel like I've only scratched the surface of this one, despite me having already found every secret, nook, and cranny. Most of this replayability comes about through the game's massive world and its corresponding level design. Each and every room feels meticulously crafted to not only allow for some really enjoyable and challenging platforming that makes stellar use of all of the abilities at Sargon's disposal, but also doubles as environmental hazards for both you and your enemies as launching enemies into hazards or grabbing something from the environment with your pocket dimension ability and chucking it at your foes adds even more variety into the combat. But what I find most impressive is just how well the Lost Crown translates the cinematic platforming elements of the early Prince of Persia games, as well as the Sands of Time and its sequels, into a new genre while sticking true to the theme of devious traps and precision timing and skill needed to traverse them. Many rooms in this game just have some of the coolest and most challenging 2D platforming I've ever seen that requires more than just quick reflexes to master, but also a quick wit as well. Some of these challenges act more as puzzles than just pure platforming, and the large amount of space afforded by the game's enormous map as well as its myriad of collectibles means that there are plenty of opportunities to really put your skills to the test, and more importantly, at your own pace and by your own volition. This is, thankfully, the kind of metroidvania that allows for more open-ended play rather than simply following a set-in-stone sequence of events. The game is really good about hinting at where you need to go or just flat out telling you if you turn on waypoints in the options menu like a filthy casual, but then leaving you to your own devices as to how to get there with the level design having enough variety and branching paths for you to carve your own route rather than always having to find an intended route. The fact that the Lost Crown's map is so large and sprawling also means that there's a lot of the game that's entirely optional, I reckon about 40% or so, and that's always a nice thing to see, as it shows how much the developers actually cared about delivering an engaging experience, as optional areas really make the player feel rewarded for taking the time to explore, rather than like they're just checking off a to-do list. However, as I mentioned last time in my Momodora critique, did you watch it yet? 
because you should. The downside of having a large and sprawling map such as this is that you unwittingly inject a lot of backtracking, downtime, and confusion, as well as a reliance on the game's map system to figure out where to go and what to do, rather than the level design naturally leading you in the right direction, and this is unfortunately the case with the Lost Crown. This also affects the collectibles and secrets you find throughout your journey, as going back to a previous area with a new ability, one of the hallmarks of the genre, requires a much greater time investment that can kill the pacing of the game and reduce the narrative tension, as well as just wasting a bunch of the player's time by them having to retread the same areas over and over again just so they can go back and get some power-ups. Power-ups that you'll almost certainly need because this game is a lot more difficult than you'd expect from an Ubisoft title, and I mean that in the best way. Unlike Momodora, where I collected almost everything by the time I beat the game, I finished the Lost Crown with a pitiful 60% completion rating, and I'd be lying if I said that taking the time to reach 100% wasn't a bit of a grind rather than the enjoyable victory lap that going back and collecting stuff in a Metroidvania usually is. There are a few tools at the player's disposal that can help minimize backtracking and downtime to a certain extent. One of these is the game's fast travel system, but the developers were, in my opinion, just a bit stingy with how many warp points they added in comparison to how large the overall map is, and their placement can also be a bit strange at times, with some of them being right next to each other, just a few rooms away, and others being completely isolated in a very large section of the map, as well as the fact that some of them are placed in a position that forces you to traverse through a particularly annoying room after warping to them, so the warp system helps, but it could have been done better by my standards. Another tool that the game adds in is what are called memory shards, which is a system whereby you can take a screenshot of the position you're in and add that screenshot to the map. This can be useful if you happen to find a secret that you can't get yet, or see something out of the ordinary that you can't interact with, so you take a quick snapshot, save it to your map, and then you can use it to remind yourself about this spot later. This is a great system that's almost necessary for a game with a map as large as this, though I do find it a little bit silly that there's a limit to how many of these snapshots you can take at a time, as well as the fact that you can increase the number of snapshots you can take through finding more memory shards out in the wild. A system like this is probably best if you don't try to gamify it too much and just consider it part of the interface rather than like an ability your character is aware of. Still, it's a great addition and I hope to see a similar system incorporated into other Metroidvanias in the future. Alright, before we wrap up I need to talk about another big aspect of this game which is the bosses and they're fine. Some of them, like this manticore dude, are pretty damn fun and challenging, as are Ice King and this lady riding a big ol' woof, but most of the bosses greatly overdo it with their attempts at spectacle, which, in my opinion, kills the pacing of each fight and just makes me want to deliver a gigantic UGH. Remember how last time we talked about Moonlit Farewell's spectacle and how it uses it to increase the enjoyment and flow of combat when fighting bosses? Well, many of the Lost Crown's bosses are the perfect example of how not to do this. I'm not saying these bosses are necessarily bad, but the Montpellier team has a really bad habit of constantly stopping and starting the fight with numerous mid-battle cutscenes, super attacks done by bosses that lock you into a lengthy visual set piece that deals loads of damage to the player, and difficult to manage combos that get really repetitive really quickly while the battles themselves go on for far longer than they should, mostly because the game has to stop so your enemy can go Super Saiyan three or four times per battle. The thing is, they're not even really all that hard, as with the exception of a couple of them, I beat them all on my first try despite the fact that I was taking hit after hit from attacks that you're unlikely to dodge your first time seeing them, yet I'd always seem to emerge victorious in the end and feel a little bit disappointed after it was over. My overall impression is that the dev team cared way too much about making a spectacle of the bosses and jacked up their speed and super moves and the number of mid-battle cutscenes to make you feel as though some serious shit is going down, but then also balance their damage output to compensate and give the player a chance rather than just tightening up their design like Moonlit Farewell did, leading to boss encounters that ultimately fall flat rather than getting your adrenaline going as the game intends. At least, that was my experience, as I have heard that a lot of people have been really struggling with some of the bosses in this game, but that just kind of adds further credence to my claim that most of the bosses just aren't very well designed due to their level of flashiness and spectacle the Montpellier team tried to incorporate into them through the usual methods of sloppy gameplay and by pissing all over the player's sense of agency and control. Look, your battle animations are really cool, I'll give you that, but when I'm fighting a boss, I just want to fight the boss. I just can't stand it when the gameplay is constantly interrupted by story beats, cutscenes, or your adversary having to power up a million times and preventing you from dealing damage to them for a moment or two. Just let your gameplay speak for itself, and for the love of God, go play Momodora Moonlit Farewell and learn how to be a spectacle without taking control away from the player every 15 seconds. K, thanks, bye. Ugh. <sighs>
Again, I'm not saying the bosses are bad, just that they're not up to the same level of quality as the rest of the game and function far too much as a vehicle for delivering narrative and spectacle rather than interesting and challenging gameplay as they should. But to be fair, they didn't sour my overall experience of the game all that much, and for the most part, everything else the game does more than makes up for this one dropped ball. What we're left with is a game that has much higher highs than something like Momodora Moonlit Farewell, but also much lower lows. Prince of Persia The Lost Crown is a bit rough around the edges and more than a little sloppy in some places, but when taken as a whole, the game delivers an excellent experience that's certainly worth multiple playthroughs. Despite its flaws, I really enjoyed it, and I think for fans of the Metroidvania genre, this one's a no-brainer. The Lost Crown is now unquestionably the best game in the Prince of Persia series, so do yourself a favor and give it a shot if you haven't yet. Also, uh, I happen to have it on good authority that the Switch version of the game runs excellent in emulation. Take that information as you will. I'm Noah Lee, god of game criticism, and thus have I spoken.